My name is Paul Young, and I'm the author of The Shack. I want to invite you on an adventure with me and with the book. A lot of you have read it, you have questions. Some of you have just heard about it, and you have questions. This is a book that allows us to explore relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Questions that we have about hurt and loss and grief. Questions about wonder and beauty and joy. What does it mean to live a life of faith? What do we do about death? Why do tragic things happen to us? These are the questions that we want to explore. And I would love you to come with me. This is an invitation. It's impossible to apprehend God, to comprehend God, especially not directly. A lot of times we've tried to do it with our minds and our rationality. It's not that this is mindless, but the best way to comprehend the character and nature of God is through metaphor and story. It meets us as a whole person. This is the metaphor of the shack. Our parents impact our theology. Our theology then reparents us. The shack is the house on the inside that people help you build. And some of you, you got good help. You had parents who were present and wanted to love you and did and encouraged you and affirmed you. So some of the inside house for some of us are habitable places, but for a lot of us, it's just a shack. And that shack is the house that is our soul. It is our heart. And for some of us, it's broken. And it becomes the place where we then hide all of our addictions and we store all our secrets. And we never want to invite another human being into that place because we're terrified that they're going to hate us the way that we already do. Story. Everybody has one. Actually, everybody is one. And every story matters. I want to read to you a couple sections from the foreword. And these are a little telling on me. I'll explain that. Mac later learned that they, that's his mother and siblings, had been shuttled off to Aunt May's in order to give his father some freedom to teach his rebellious son a lesson about respect. For almost two days, tied to the big oak at the back of the house, he was beaten with a belt and Bible verses every time his dad woke from a stupor and put down his bottle. Mac once told me that he used to speak his mind more freely in his younger years, but he admitted that most of such talk was a survival mechanism, all to cover his hurts. He often ended up spewing his pain on everyone around him. He says that he had a way of pointing out people's faults and humiliating them while maintaining his own sense of false power and control. Not too endearing. That last section is so me. <laughs> when I was younger, you know, I'm like five foot six. I'm not very big. I've lost pretty much every fist fight I've ever been in. But I learned to hide knives inside words. I could take a 300 pound man down to his knees by cutting him precisely with the right language. And I was equipped with theological language on top of that. So I had God in my back pocket to empower my ability to hurt people. It was a defense mechanism because of the pain that I'd experienced. Now my dad never tied me to a tree and beat me for two days. But I have friends that that did happen to, really happened to. My dad wasn't an alcoholic. He was addicted to mission and ministry. And 
out of his hurt, out of his loss, it spewed out in terms of abuse of discipline and rage. I think it was Leanne Payne who said, the unconfessed is the unhealed. We have to learn to talk about our great sadnesses. We have to find a way to let somebody into that space. We're designed to be in community. We've never been designed to be alone. We have to begin to take the risk of telling the truth, of speaking things that are real, of going back into our histories and into our shacks and talking about our great sadness. I want to tell you a little bit more about my dad. My father's family, and he was in the middle of the pack, was dysfunctional, damaged, hurt. My grandmother died at age 39 after spending a couple years in an asylum. And my dad was left an orphan. Most of the boys were sent to farms and they became farm workers at, as teenagers. And they lived in the barns and watched the families through the windows. I overheard my dad say to one of his brothers one day, maybe that's why I was so angry. At 14, my dad runs away and he runs into the logging camps in British Columbia. And you know, logging camps, they're such warm, inviting, 14 years old. At 18, two of his sisters take him to a revival meeting and it changes his world. And he walks out of the logging camps and straight into Bible school in central Canada. That's where he meets my mother. They get married, spends a year as an itinerant pastor up in Alberta. I'm born in Grand Prairie, Alberta. And 10 months old, we pack everything up. We move to the highlands of New Guinea on the other side of the world where I grow up. So you can see that my dad, he didn't have the chip for being a dad. His father had destroyed that. And his father before that had destroyed my grandfather. This legacy had continued. And that became part of my history. My dad terrified me. He was angry, and I never knew why, but I knew it was my fault. And over the course of my childhood, he smashed my emotions into non-existence. I quit crying. I vowed never again. Nobody would ever see me weak like that. I also inherited my dad's theology, and it matched it. Distant, unrelatable God, angry and disappointed most of the time. Righteous, only the righteous God is allowed to be angry. I no longer was allowed to be angry. And that distant God was willing to beat the hell out of his son in order to be right with other people. Jesus saved me. He saved me from God the Father. And I always felt like as long as Jesus would stay between me and God the Father, maybe I would be safe too. My dad didn't bring a lot to the table. He brought what he had. One of my favorite things that Jesus ever said He's looking down from the cross and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he's talking to me, about me. And he's talking about my dad. Once you get inside story, that person no longer is a category. They become a human being. And the possibility of relationship just opens up. There is this part of Genesis that we have this habit because of our own shame of projecting onto the face of God our own lostness and our own self-hatred. We think God relates to us the way that we relate to ourselves. And so even in our 
interpretation of scripture a lot of times it comes across as if it was God speaking punitively and retributively rather than lovingly because God is love. God is not punishment or retribution. God is love, is love. In this scene, Adam and Isha, because her name has not been truly revealed, they have now participated in an act of turning away from face to face with God. They've eaten of the fruit and they hid inside the very tree in the original Hebrew. It doesn't say they hid in the bushes like it says in the English. They hid in the tree. They were covering themselves up with their ability to determine good and evil. They've made themselves the arbiters of truth independently. And they hear the sound of God. And it says in the English, walking in the cool of the day. And the first thing that you hear is, where are you? Tell me where you are. God knows where they are. This is an invitation to relationship. And he said, I'm afraid. I heard you. And already Adam has begun to project upon the face of God this punitive, retributive, mean, self-absorbed, narcissistic imagination. I was afraid and ashamed because we were naked. And here's the line. God says, who told you you were naked? And a lot of times we read that line with our modern self disgust or self apprehension about our mortality, our humanity, our sexuality. And we think that there's something wrong that God is saying about the fact that they were unclothed. That's not the point at all. God is saying, who told you you were naked? I did. You were meant to be living exposed and open and weak and fragile. You're covering yourself up by your own ability to determine what the truth is, what the good is, what the evil is. Who told you? I told you. Being exposed is a good thing. The Holy Spirit comes to convict. That word in the Greek means to expose. We weren't ever designed to live hidden and inside of our lies and inside of self-deception. We were intended to be fully open face to face with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is a relationship that we can trust with all the things that we hide, with all the secrets that we have. We were designed to live naked and unashamed. Another great sadness for me began before I even went to boarding school. Sexual abuse started for me inside the tribal culture, inside what I considered my own family before I was five years old. There is nothing that destroys and dismantles the soul of a human being like sexual abuse. I get to boarding school at age six and the first nights, the big boys would come at night and molest the little boys. That became just part of my world and I just shut down. I needed to perform. I needed to be acceptable. I knew even at five, something was wrong. And even by six, it had been so dominant that I was to some degree already a predator. You can twist the heart of a child. Great sadness, sexual abuse, my relationship with my dad. So what did I do? First born missionary kid, preacher's kid. I became a performer. This is why religion was attractive to me. It could give me a list of rules that if I could just do those things, maybe I could win the affection of my father. Maybe I could win the affection of God. And here's what I did. I hated the shack. I hated this person. 
And so I drug some pieces of wood from my own shack and I built a facade about a hundred yards out. You know a facade, they use it in movies to kind of fake that there's a real building there, but it's a quarter inch piece of plywood. But the thing about a facade is you can paint it as fast as you can pick up people's expectations. And so I became a different thing in every different situation. But it didn't protect me from the addictions. They still went on. It didn't protect me from the secrets. The facade was my presentation to the world, and I was a different thing depending on what audience was in front of me. See, I didn't know how to live from the inside out. Life became about living from the outside in. And I worked at it hard. I had this thin layer of perfectionist performance that covered up this ocean of shame. And I was hoping if I could just do this right, if I could just perform perfectly, maybe one day I could become a real boy. We are as sick as the secrets we keep. And my shack was full of them. And so when somebody comes into our life and they offer us kindness, and goodness, and grace, and forgiveness. We don't believe them because they don't know our secrets. So we're absolutely trapped. We can't tell you because you're gonna think that I am exactly what I already believe. I'm a worthless piece of nothingness. But when you offer me something that might keep me alive, I don't believe you because you don't know my secrets. This is the shack. This is the facade. And the thing about healing is that you have to go back to the shack. You have to find out that God is in that place and not in the facade. We are as sick as the secrets we keep. We have to deal with our broken hearts. If we want to become real human beings, you can't go around the shack. You have to go into it. The last few years have been, how might I put it, remarkably peculiar. Mac has changed. He's even more different and special than he used to be. And all the time I've known him, he's always been a rather gentle and kind soul, but since his stay in the hospital three years ago, he's been, well, even nicer. He's become one of those rare people who are totally at home in their own skin. And I feel at home around him, like I do with nobody else. When we go our separate ways, it seems that I've just had the best conversation of my life, even though I usually have done most of the talking. And with respect to God, Mac is no longer just wide. He's gone way deep. But the dive cost him dearly. These days are very different from seven or so years ago when the great sadness entered his life. And he almost quit talking altogether. Life as a journey. Life as process. That statement in the forward is one that I always had hoped to be able to make for myself, but didn't think it was a possibility. Early in these episodes, I want you to know that that's the truth for me now. Something I never thought was possible, that I'd be comfortable in my own skin. I had a friend of mine ask me one morning at a conference, so what's it like being Paul Young today? <laughs> I said, it's the easiest. My life was all messed up and complicated when I was trying to be somebody else. When I had all the secrets buried inside. When I was all hidden. When the darkness and the lies are inside and kept inside the imprisonment of our own hearts. They are huge. When we let them out, they lose their power. The, the process of that 
incredibly painful at times. And there's huge risk involved, but there's always gonna be risk involved in trust. And trust is where we're headed, not to control, not to religion, to relationship. And this is a God who will always be with you, will never leave you, and never forsake you. I was uh, on a flight with a famous person, and uh, I, I asked him after a couple hours, who in your life do you trust? And he shook his head and he said, my mom, my dad, my sister. Max laying on the dock with Jesus, and they're looking at the stars and laughing, and finally his grief begins to slip through. And he says, I feel so lost. And he feels a hand take his and not let go. And Jesus says to him, I know, Mac, but I'm here, and I'm not lost. How powerful are secrets in your life? And who have you let in? Do you think keeping your secrets is safer than letting them out? Think about the power of secrets in your life. And I'll see you next time. Thank you.